Today we're turning our attention to the Eastern Cape as we've been going since last week, province by province. So how is the coronavirus being tackled in the Eastern Cape? That province has the third highest number of confirmed cases with 1,936 infections. And interprovincial travel and funerals have so far proven to be the biggest headache for the Eastern Cape's COVID-19 response team. Yeah, that's right. The Nelson Mandela Bay and Buffalo City metros have recorded the highest number of infections and attendees at funerals have uh, spread the virus to rural areas. Now Cuban doctors have been deployed to that province to work alongside the local health care workers. We're now joined via Skype by Eastern Cape Health MEC Cindy Swakomba. MEC, thanks very much for your time. Welcome to the AM report. Let's start by tackling some of those social activity related issues such as funerals. I mean, give us a sense of whether or not that issue still remains a headache as we put it in our intro for that province. Oh, thank you very much and good morning to all. The funerals are a biggest headache in the Eastern Cape, precisely on the basis that more people would come and not, we are not informed, but villages after that would have a sparking increase in terms of COVID people and would panic at the end of the day, have anxiety. And what is so amazing, in fact, shocking in terms of what is happening, is that leadership of the area would not get involved to even inform us sometimes. They will get into those areas they will only tell us that we need some testing. We have had a funeral that came from Cape Town and other people now are coughing, other people are, have flu. Please, please come in and test. So that for us is becoming a, 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 a really difficult target that is moving all the time. Mm. MEC, you're talking about testing. Give us a sense of your testing numbers to date. The number that I have in front of me here is that about one in seven of the province's people, and there are 6.7 million people in your province, one in seven is being screened. Is that good enough? How many people are actually being tested? Our testing has now gone beyond 20,000 testing, but screening itself is well beyond a million. It's just that as I'm standing here, I don't have exact numbers for you, but the last I know, we're at 1,2 in terms of screening. As you would recall, we do not test until we screen. Right. Uh, so, MEC, I understand that part of the provincial strategy is to also to provide water and sanitation um, at schools amongst many other places. Many people are already asking questions about whether or not it's a little too late, especially considering that, you know, areas like Makanda have sort of battled a drought for years now. Give us a sense of how that's going. I mean, do you feel that you're able to catch up fast enough in order to flatten the curve and beat the pandemic in the province? My understanding is that that area is in the Department of Health. However, in the reports that are always coordinated by the government, we get updated reports. We are not yet with every report in terms of water and sanitation. However, there are partnerships with the Department of Water Affairs, which is directly involved with the district municipalities in the provision of such. They're moving, of course, in the areas, but my view is that they are doing the best they can. But the issue of water does have its history in the area of the Eastern Cape, where majority of people never had water to start with. They drank from rivers. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if most of our areas do have that problem, of course, it would not be an issue that you can overcome overnight. Suffice to say, there are movements in that area I mean, where tents are being provided. Yeah. Uh, MEC, this is a devastating issue for the Eastern Cape, the, the fact that there is no clean running water. We know that tanks have been provided, as you say. We are told that most of those tanks, they were delivered with water in them. They have now run dry. That water has not been replaced. Just this morning on Newsroom Africa, we spoke with Professor Glenda Gray, who again, you know, reinforced the important measures we need to take to fight COVID-19. And certainly, washing our hands all the time is one of those important uh, measures. How are you working to rectify this and to rectify it quickly? Obviously, my view would be that the, the district municipalities in those areas have a responsibility to fill those tanks. Now that you are telling, I'm sure I would be able in the meeting that we're having today in the afternoon to talk to the MEC for COCTA 
to start to actually say it is a matter that we need to monitor. It might be that we are providing tanks, but the tanks are fewer than the community of the area. As such, water runs fast, runs out faster than anticipated. And I still say the partnership of the district should actually get into that picture and cover that space in terms of filling with those tanks. So, MEC, you weren't aware that the tanks were running dry before we just pointed that out to you. Is that what you're saying? The problem is I'm in health, and I would only get to know about water when you raise it like this. The MEC for water is the one that directly monitors the issues of it. But this is a health emergency, wouldn't you agree, MEC? No water in most of your province. That is a health emergency. I do, in particular, as we are promoting hygiene. One of those instances in action is hand wash. I do. And some say it's a matter I will also raise with the MEC for COVID. Mm. All right. Uh, let's turn our attention to the state of readiness of hospitals, if we can. We understand that about 20 Cuban doctors have been uh, deployed to the Eastern Cape in areas such as Port Elizabeth and East London. How are they supplementing the healthcare workers that are already there in the fight against the pandemic? Thank you very much. I do believe that the supplementing by the Cuban Brigade is quite important. It comes at a good time, in particular as we revise our own strategy. Our old strategy, in fact, I'm not saying old strategy because it's a mix of a new way of doing things and the old way of doing things. Ordinarily, what we're doing was mass screening. Now, our screening and testing is so focused that it goes directly to the areas where there is COVID as hotspots but actually puts them into clusters. And those clusters now, we are not waiting for people to self-isolate. We take out whoever is a conduct and start to put them in quarantine, and we go on to allow them back into the community after they've been tested and we are sure they are negative. That, for us, is an improvement to the way we're doing things. So the involvement of the doctors from Cuba is adding a number. For instance, we didn't have epidemiologists that actually are giving us six at a time. But now we're going to be able to have increased resources in terms of that area. Mm. That in itself is a plus for us. And of course, personal protective equipment, that is a big issue around the country. It's an issue in your province as well. Health workers at clinics and hospitals in particular complaining that these PPEs were being hoarded instead of being distributed to them, to the people who are at the front lines. What's the situation with regard to keeping your health professionals safe? I do believe after our assessment, where we found that majority of hospitals and facilities were hoarding to stock, things have a bit changed. Because what we didn't know before we sent out members to actually go directly to their stores was how much exactly do they have. Now that we know, people don't have an excuse as CEOs in the facilities to say they don't have. You, have, you might have seen, if you were here, a, 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 a drastic change in the availability of PPEs in those facilities. And after we've made those in local inspections in the stores of the facilities, the, the strikes themselves are quieter than they were before we did that. So, uh, MEC, we'd also heard that about 50.5 million rand or so has been set aside to upgrade about 29 healthcare facilities, raising questions about how bad the facilities were before this pandemic came around. I mean, can you give us an idea of how much upgrading needed to take place and how that might have stifled your ability to respond adequately to the pandemic? Thank you very much. You would recall that the system that was in the Eastern Cape was a three-system uh, health system where there was Transkei, Siskei, and South Africa. And if you go to the other two, that was Transkei and Siskei, the majority of structures in those areas would be mud structures. And those mud structures would only be, would have been done by either a king or the prince of the area or the community itself would build their own clinic because they need it. What now we've started to do, not even now that it is COVID, we had already started to do that. We've started because we're talking NHI, and as we talk to universal healthcare, we're forced to get in and upgrade some of the clinics. And we're moving with that as now we're caught with COVID. 
what we have then accepted and taken as a direction is that COVID must give us an opportunity to put some upgrades into our own hospitals rather than build mostly filled hospitals, use tents. We actually are doing renovations. So the money that's spoken about is money that is administered by the Department of Public Works in actually ensuring that we are re-engineering our hospitals. We are at the end of the day wanting to see that we have got some legacy that is left because of COVID that is going to contribute to the standards of NHI. Health MEC Sindiswa Gomba from the Eastern Cape, thanks very much for your time this morning on the AM report. Let's hope that we can get that issue with the water tankers resolved and resolved quickly. It's a matter of life and death.